Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us at this webinar. We are very much looking forward to it. And I will be handing over very shortly to our chair, Zoe Metcalf, for this event um, in a moment or two. We're just taking a few moments to allow people to arrive um, for attendees to come through the virtual door, as it were. Um, and I just wanted to let you know, so my name is Jessie Wilde and I'm from the Bristol Housing Festival. And I just, for those of you that aren't aware, I just wanted to let you know that this event is um, one of a number of different events that are going on as part of the Bristol Housing Festival Virtual Expo for 2020. So every year the Bristol Housing Festival hosts um, an annual expo this year due to uh, COVID and all the, all, the, all the kind of virtual world we find ourselves in, we have hosted the whole event virtually. So if you've missed any of the webinars so far, you can find them all on our YouTube channel. We've also done a series of one-to-one -one interviews with um, different people uh, and, and you can find the lineup of interviews again on our YouTube channel. Um, there's a direct link from our website. Um, but if you've missed anything, like I say, do go through our website. So for those of you that are just joining us, my name is Jessie Wilde and I'm from the Bristol Housing Festival and you are just in time for our webinar. And I'm gonna be handing over to Zoe Metcalf very shortly. Um, to introduce this fabulous panel and this lineup for our event. It's the second in a series of two webinars um, called Homelessness in a Pandemic and addressing the kind of challenges and, um, and the opportunities that are faced when we look at homelessness in this time of a pandemic. But as I was just saying, if the Bristol Housing Festival, is this, we're hosting a three week series of event, events this year um, and you'll be able to catch up with any of the webinars you've missed on our YouTube channel. If you're interested in any of the other events coming up, you can find the lineup of events and all the speakers on our website, which is bristolhousingfestivals.org.uk. So do drop on our website and have a little look there and you should be able to find all the information you need. Now, I think I have talked for long enough and I think we have um, most people through the virtual door as it were by now. So I'm gonna officially hand over, it's my pleasure to hand over to Zoe Metcalf who's gonna be chairing this event. Zoe, thank you so much. Thanks, Jesse. Um, and uh, I'm just going to say it before I forget that this event is streaming live um, and we'd really like your engagement as part of this conversation in order that we can take action um, following the panel today. Um, so please do use the Q&A at the bottom of the webinar to submit your questions. Um, so um, we've got a fantastic panel here today um, who are all experts in the field and are making things happen out there on the ground, both from um, a trust and um, activist perspective, but also from a corporate perspective. Um, so just before I introduce um, the panel, I'm just going to set a little bit of context. Um, currently in the UK, we have circa 280,000 people homeless um, and homelessness is projected to increase even more. And we know that a key driver of homelessness is a shortage of affordable housing and particular social rented properties. Um, in the West of England, Bristol faces the most significant ch challenges. In Bristol, we currently have 521 households living in temporary accommodation and 1,200 200 people are on the waiting list for housing. There are 955 homeless individuals currently supported by St Monk Go's outreach team and on any given night without programming there would be an average of 84 to 100 people sleeping rough in our city and statistics do show um, a rapid rise in homelessness over the last seven years. Um, uh, the sheer scale of the coordinated response in lockdown and beyond is staggering in this region um, and we've seen um, 1,100 people housed during this period and it's based on a strong foundation of relationships, collective willpower and co-creation. Um, our panel yesterday um, on homelessness highlighted the inequality and disproportionate impact on the BAME community, low income families due to overcrowding, sub substandard living accommodation um, and threat and fear of eviction and also bureaucracy of process and language as a barrier to accessing services um, and the impact of gentrification and displacement. Um, with an urgent need for fair renting and the need to move amateur landlords uh, towards a place of being ethical private landlords. Um, so I'm, I'm also really pleased to celebrate the fact that um, following all of this coordination in Bristol, um, we safely accommodated homeless families and individuals throughout the pandemic with only one known case of COVID-19, which is remarkable. Um, so without further ado, I'm now going to move to the panel to introduce themselves. Um, so I'm going to start with asking David to introduce himself, please. 
Hello, uh, I'm David Ingerslev. I'm the regional head for St Mungo's uh, for Bristol area. Uh, and we are a specialist uh, charity working with people who are rough sleeping uh, and homeless. Welcome, thanks, David. And now to Lizzie. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Lizzie Briggs. I'm the director of Bristol Hospitality Network, uh, maternity cover. Bristol Hospitality Network works with destitute asylum seekers in Bristol. Thanks, Lizzie. And to you, Jessica. Hello, I'm Jessica. I'm the Chief Executive of Emmaus Bristol. So we're a local homelessness charity um, and we work a bit differently to some other homelessness charities. So we provide a home support and work experience of our social enterprises. Um, and by doing that, people are able to sign off benefits and we pay them an allowance um, instead. Uh, and we also support people with no recourse to public funds. Great. Thanks, Jessica. And now to Paul. Hello, I'm Paul and I am the founder of a Right to Shelter campaign, which is about trying to get a homeless um, day centre together with combined with all the services that are required. Thanks, Paul. And now to our corporate contributors today. So over to John. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Bauer, and I'm a partner with law firm Womble Bond Dickinson. I specialise in planning and development, but also in our Bristol office, I head up responsible, responsible business. So that's our engagement in the community. So really looking forward to the uh, discussion this afternoon. Thanks, John. And last but not least, Kirsty. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Kirsty Hall and I work for Nationwide Building Society and um, because we're a building society, we're owned by our members, we're really lucky enough that some of our profit is um, fed back into the local community and my team manages that budget um, and we work very closely with some strategic charity partners but we also manage a, a huge volunteering um, and fundraising programme and a large grants programme. Great, thanks Kirsty. So now what we're going to do is we're going to hear from David, Lizzie and Jessica who are going to talk um, briefly about homelessness from their perspective and their experiences and how um, they um, impact and um, have an, have an uh, active role. Um, and then for them to propose how they consider businesses and communities can meaningfully contribute to tackling homelessness, asking some key asks um, of us. So um, David, if I start with you, please. Yes. Um, so St so Mungo's uh, yeah, is a large charity. We work with people who, who are rough sleeping uh, and, and homeless. Um, I think Zoe's figure earlier of 955 people was probably the number of people our outreach team worked with in a, in a year in Bristol rather than open at any one time. Um, but we've known over a number of years that homelessness is a, a significant issue in Bristol caused exactly as, uh, as set out in the introduction um, because of the affordability of accommodation, particularly in Bristol. Um, during the initial response to the pandemic outbreak, we've been privileged to play a key role uh, setting up three out of a total of five additional emergency accommodation centres uh, in Bristol in late March uh, 2020 in, in some of the city's vacant hotels and youth hostels. Um, over the six months since the beginning of lockdown in Bristol, St Mungo's has helped 467 people who were rough sleeping or previously staying in a communal night shelter that couldn't run anymore because of the infection risk to uh, be able to move into a, a space where they could get uh, their own uh, self-contained space uh, in a, either an empty hotel or other emergency accommodation through the Everyone In initiative. Um, and we've supported 186 people to make uh, positive moves into longer term housing during that, that short term period. Um, our, what we had to do was, was to pivot teams that we already had in place uh, from previous related services uh, to, to run those emergency hotels, uh, accommodating over 150 people each night. Uh, but we also continued to run all the existing rough sleeping outreach, supported accommodation and, and mental health projects uh, in the city. Um, in Bristol, the, the initial costs were covered by government funding, um, distributed by the local authority to, to pay for the, some of this accommodation cost. Um, a small amount up front uh, and, and then eventually, retrospectively, uh, funding the financial risk that had previously that was then covered by Bristol City Council. So it was a huge commitment by the local authority to not let anyone um, 
be without an option during this emergency pandemic period, which we're absolutely privileged to be part of. Um, because of this, uh, this initiative, the Everyone In initiative, we've seen numbers of people sleeping rough dropping dramatically. Uh, you know, if it turns out if we provide loads of accommodation, people use it, you know, which is what you'd hope. Um, but it's been great to see because we know that uh, rough sleeping is, is very hazardous, dangerous uh, and harmful to health for people who, uh, who experience it. Um, we were able to reach out to partners across the city, work with them, uh, train and support volunteers to work in hotels alongside uh, experienced staff. Um, we particularly worked with volunteers from Bristol Church's Winter Night Shelter, the Julian Trust, 125, In Hope, uh, and, and some of the volunteers who are already working with St Mungo's have played an absolutely vital role in supporting these emergency hotels throughout the whole time. Um, what we saw was an amazing coming together um, of the local authority, partner organisations, uh, our, our staff, uh, drug and alcohol services for people who needed it uh, and some support from mental health services. As we've now all acclimatised to uh, setting up and working within, you know, living with new COVID secure environments, um, we have got some uh, some key needs and some key asks and, and there's uh, certainly a role that uh, business can play in meeting some of those needs. Um, I would summarise four key areas. Um, the first is, is, I suppose I get to do my Bob Geldof moment. We, we need your money. Um, we do need money coming from the government, uh, but also donations and uh, corporate partnerships can play a key role in that. I know we have uh, very uh, been very grateful to benefit from uh, some uh, significant support from Nationwide during this emergency pandemic period. That's not a setup for Kirsty later, but I'm sure uh, she would have mentioned it. So I'll get in there first. Um, I, I, and we need that to, to keep operating emergency provision. Um, the, the second thing that's needed is, uh, is move on accommodation. So we need uh, access to housing where people can move on to. We've, we've got quite a good uh, picture of, of supported accommodation in the city. We have something like 853, I think it is, units of um, supported accommodation. So a unit is, a, is either a single person or a whole family. Um, but it's it's getting people moving on so that they can live in their own place after that once they've they're in a in a process where they've got the support to to recover from homelessness that is is re a real challenge in bristol um in in the early stages though you know the hotels and and uh, youth hostels that have been vacant are going back to operating in a covid secure way so we, there is a need for meanwhile use buildings as well um, especially if they already have a, a spec for residential use and, and if they are available for uh, for at least a number of months. Uh, you know, if they're, if they're available for less than four months, that's probably not helpful in terms of the amount of setup and, and clearing up that it takes to, to get things going. Um, and, and last but by no means least is, is employment opportunities that are absolutely crucial to, so that people ideally can not have to rely on uh, the benefit system, which sometimes can be uh, quite difficult for people to engage with. There's quite a lot of requirements on people to uh, to deal with. The the amount of uh, of money that you will get on benefits is not nearly as much as you would get through through employment. And particularly for European nationals, um, there is limited right to uh, move into accommodation without having worker status. So it's so it's absolutely crucial. Um, well, thanks very much for for listening. I'm looking forward to hearing what the other uh, panelists have to say. Great, David. That's really useful. Some very um, simple and, and um, clear asks there. Um, so, Lizzie, can I move on to you, please? Yeah, sure. So, um, British Hospitality Network support destitute asylum seekers. That's individuals who've got no recourse to public funds, so no right to rent privately, no permission to work, um, and essentially are made destitute. They're individuals who've come across and had their um, right to asylum refused, but they're able to make a fresh claim. And what BHN do is provide accommodation and wraparound support. The accommodation takes the form of, we have a, a 10 bed house um, in Bristol that currently has 10 adult males and a host couple who live in the house. But we also have a host network, which is like people like you or I providing spare rooms and asylum center for a minimum of about three months, um, likely more. Um, before COVID, we had a drop in on a Monday, 
which was also attended by a mixture of refugees and asylum seekers across the city. Um, and Bristol's really lucky as a city of sanctuary, um, and also because the city we are, to have quite a lot of refugee and asylum seeker charities, um, some of which provide drop-ins. So a, an individual could go to a drop-in every day of the week if, it, if they wanted to. Those drop-ins stopped due to lockdown on the 23rd of March, um, and everything's kind of moved online. We've got a similar journey story to St Mungo's in that sense, that um, uh, we pivoted our staff to, to uh, do an emergency, emergency response, really, to our asylum seekers and focus primarily on the 30 people at that point that we were housing. And the needs that came out were about keeping the accommodation network stable, which was difficult. Um, different hosts were self-isolating or having family come and stay with them, so we had to move people around the network. Um, Poverty became quite an issue as well, where we wanted to be able to communicate with individuals, but they didn't have enough money for phone pop-ups or a smartphone to be able to use. Um, also, we had to uh, make sure that they got enough food because some of our individuals might have had some other bits of income coming in, which completely stopped during lockdown. We increased our solidarity fund, which was £10 a week. £20 a week, um, as did the rest of the organisations in the, in the sector. And then wellbeing became, obviously, as you can imagine, quite a huge issue for us. So we were doing welfare calls to our asylum seekers and our hosts every week for the first kind of couple of months of the pandemic. Um, it, we, I mean, it's been really difficult for our members, which is what we call the asylum seekers who seek support from DHN. Um, it's been a really difficult time, but equally, I'm really impressed with how my staff have been able to respond to their needs um, and also the organisations as well. Um, we had quite great partnerships already with charities like Bristol Refugee Rights, Borderlands, um, Refugee Women of Bristol, Aidbox, Red Cross, I keep on naming them. Um, but during the pandemic, they really tightened the collaboration to help people was so important. And um, we were having regular calls and that was just... An amazing thing to see. It was kind of the silver lining off the back of what happened. But also, our relationship with the Bristol City Council has developed um, greatly in this time, partly due to the everyone in um, approach. And they've got a, a certain amount of asylum seekers who are in their hotels, um, some of which are eligible for DHN. So we've been working really closely with the council to try and find new hosts to provide that move on accommodation um, when the hotels go back to their normal um, purpose. That's been really amazing for us to be able to work so closely with them and I've been really impressed with how they've worked. Um, for BHN, um, I'm not always sure how the business community can help, apart from, again, what David said. Um, our main ask at the moment is our host expansion project, so we're essentially doubling our host network. We started a campaign on August the 5th to require and um, request more hosts um, to come forward. We had about 40 people that I contact us and from that we've got about seven new host households but we need um at least 10 more so we're kind of trying to launch that campaign again um and uh yeah money is always really great as well but promoting the host expansion is probably the thing we need the most at the moment that's definitely one of our asks um from the business community Thanks, Lizzie. Um, that's really insightful. Um, uh, yesterday, one of our speakers, Simon Dwight from um, MHCLG, um, uh, shared a comment um, saying, getting us to think less about charity and more about shared valued outcomes. And, and something that just struck me when listening to you speaking was, what is there in terms of an opportunity for businesses, for instance, who are already providing mental health services from professionals within their corporate organisations to potentially support um, organizations like yourself in that regard um, was one thought that I had and the other was um, being aware of the, the the status issue and and how that potentially precludes them you know in terms of not having a legitimate identity you know as a citizen in the UK you know are there are the workarounds around providing opportunities around work experience that supports that sense of purpose and um, I, I don't know that's a question for you really yeah, I mean, definitely. We spend our time providing accommodation, um, providing community relationship, uh, getting to know people in the UK, understanding our culture. Um, we do lots of activities on our drop in, which of course will stop and, and we spend a lot of time um, investing in people's asylum claim. That's the other thing that we do. It's a huge part of our role to get them moving forward to their lives. Um, but ultimately, we're a really tiny charity. We have 3.3 full time equivalent and, and being able to provide meaningful volunteer experiences. We do that on a drop in. 
um, but anything which is kind of intentional and progressional is really, really difficult for us to create. And so something we've been talking about as a sector to have some kind of internship pathway is definitely some thinking around um, experience and kind of um, yeah, work experience in its, its purest kind of form. And what we'd obviously love is for the people that we help be running the organisation. <laughs> I mean, that would be the, the idealistic dream. Great. Well, that's that's food for thought, something for us to take forward. Thank you so much, Lizzie. Now I'll move on to Jessica. So um, our accommodation was already pre-pandemic ready, um, which was good. Um, the intention actually was to provide people with a home uh, that was dignified and suitable for them. And that's the reason that everyone has their own room unless they're in a couple. Most people have their own bathroom. Um, but we did think those things um, based on the idea that those were, were basic human needs, uh, not in any pandemic readiness, but it did come in handy. Um, but as I said before, our model is that the people that we support with a home also run our social enterprises. And those had to close in the in in the lockdown, and that was really difficult for a number of reasons. So first of all, uh, that our service users we, we we refer to as companions. So companions weren't able to go to work each day, and it's that stability that um, having something productive to do every day that's um, that really works in our model. Um, and we did see um, quite a big drop in people's mental health. Um, because of that and people were really really glad to come back to work when the shops were able to reopen um, and because our shops were closed we also lost income so we were losing around 5,000 a week uh, in the pandemic and we had to switch to doing some emergency fundraising instead. Um, we do claim housing benefits for those people who are entitled to it but we also provide a home to people with no recourse to public funds and my biggest fear really was that the longer the shops were closed, the more that that was threatened um, because we're able to provide that support because of the income that we generate ourselves. Um, so we did a crowdfunding campaign to make up some of the shortfall. And also we were um, lucky to get a grant from Crisis to pay for those um, solidarity places that we provide. Um, I think that in terms of, well, for us as a charity, we always say that we don't want people to be passive recipients of charity. It's really important that companions have an active role in the charity, that they're involved in decision making um, and that they're involved in the social enterprises and it's their hard work that's helping themselves out of homelessness. Um, and I think that we're not so good when we're working with businesses at doing the same thing. So I would say that charities can kind of become passive recipients of grants without actually challenging why those grants are needed. So we do have grants from uh, Lloyds Bank Foundation and we do have a grant from um, Nationwide Foundation as well, um, which is really great. But what those grants do is help us to support individuals to make incremental improvements in their lives. It allows us to help individuals. And what it doesn't do is challenge the system. And we actually need a system change here. So I would my question, I think, to businesses and to banks and investors particularly, is what are you doing with your money? Um, because it's not enough to give grants. We also have to look at where money is flowing. And money at the moment is flowing into buy to let. Um, and it's not flowing into um, providing more social housing. So, for example, if you are going to apply for a mortgage, you might be able to get a mortgage rate of around 1.5%. But if we as a charity want to borrow money to build affordable housing through social investment, you we might get offered around 8%. So it's actually a very expensive thing to add new affordable housing. And we can only do it, and we are trying to do it, if we also get grants. So the system we have at the moment is that grants are subsidising um, this sort of broken capitalist housing system that we have. Um, and because so much money has gone into buy to let, We've got all these people renting at the moment who really should be in their own homes. And that's made the rental market very, very competitive. So if you are a private landlord, you are quite naturally <laughs> going to want to rent to someone who's like you. Um, so if a professional couple come and want to rent your house, you're going to want to rent to them. You're not necessarily going to want to rent to someone who's experienced homelessness. There is a real stigma there. And um, so we do find us um, that 
the people that we've supported who are ready to move on are not able to access the private rental sector. So I think that um, private landlords need to do their bit as well um, and to work with charities like um, Emmaus Bristol, um, work with Bristol City Council, work with refugee charities to offer their properties to those in housing need um, with those charities as a kind of um, intermediary. And that does work really well. Um, uh, I would also say to businesses that really think about how you are allowing your employees to volunteer and how they're using their time. I think um, gone are the days when, uh, you know, you, you want a bank to come along and, and paint a wall for you or something. There are only so many walls that needed to be painted. Um, and that idea of um, volunteering being actually a, a team building activity is, is maybe not so useful. Um, so really think you, thinking about if you are allowing your employees to volunteer, are they using their skills? Um, because that's what charities need. And to give you an example, um, I was approached a couple of years ago by a chap who said um, he wanted to volunteer. And I said, OK, what, how do you want to volunteer? And he said, honestly, the only thing I know how to do is network engineering. Have you got anyone that wants to learn how to be a network engineer? And I said, well, I don't know, but I'll ask. And he actually had seven people come to his first evening class in, in Cisco Network Engineering. Now, only one of them lasted the course, but that person who had previously been homeless is now a qualified Cisco Network Engineer. He's just moved into his own flat that we arranged through a private landlord who was happy to rent to him with us as a kind of guarantor. Um, and he's looking for work. So. So I guess both both approaches, we, we need a system change, but also do not underestimate the impact that you can have on an individual's lives. Um, and, and we need to use all of those pressure points. We need to use our voices, our votes, our energy and our money and make sure that all of those things are going in the right direction. Jessica, thank you so much. That was really invaluable um, and uh, particularly uh, resonates for me the, the notion that we have to invest more relational time and make a real commitment and the professional side of skills. Um, and uh, rather than looking at, you know, simple that mechanism of grants, which, you know, leaves people slightly distant um, as a business from, you know, the actual action on the ground. So thank you very much. We'll pick that up, no doubt, with John and Kirsty in a little bit. Um, before we do um we're just going to speak a little bit more with um paul now um and paul can share from uh, briefly from a personal perspective his experience um from on homelessness um and what's really led him to leading this campaign on right to shelter so paul hello um yeah well basically i was around about 35 years ago i was homeless um the thing that actually made being homeless back then bearable was actually having something to be able to do during the day. Like there was a Cyrenians Day Centre, which was available. Um, two years ago, I was made homeless again due to the fact of a, a relationship breakdown. And I found that it was so much harder to to survive because there was actually nowhere to go. Um, if you can imagine having to occupy yourself for 14 hours a day with nowhere to go, um, not much money to do anything, and to be out on the streets in the weather, it's to me, it's, it's not acceptable. Um, in my mind, I think with businesses and maybe people of the, the public, they don't actually know what the word homeless, homelessness really means. Um, I think to most people, they think it's just, okay, someone's homeless, they haven't got somewhere to live. But if you dig deeper into what the word homelessness means, is you've got the fact that they become homeless, they start taking drugs, they start drinking, um, their mental health becomes affected. Um, and I think what needs to happen is um, 
people need to make relationships with the homeless people, not just homeless people, but people who are also got their own places, but who are also struggling with everyday life. But to make get a relationship with these people so that they trust you. And then you can give them a choice to whether they want to go and get help for their problems or whether they want to follow their their own paths. It's I think it's about um, having all these services wrapped around them instead of them being all fragmented all over the city. I think they need to be in one place which makes it more accessible for people and a lot easier for them to be able to use them and accessible to anyone and everyone. Thanks, Paul. And I know that when you and I've been talking about it, um, you know, this idea of generating a hub that does a number of things. One um, creates a place to go and um, a form of shelter during the day um, period, the daytime, perhaps giving people a sense of purpose, perhaps as the there's some activities or gardening or other um, such things present, but also as a hub that, like you said, signposts to the many, the, the wonderful, diverse services that we have in this city that are, uh, through their eclectic nature around the growth, located and geographically, you know, different locations is quite fragmented. Um, and uh, I know that there's significant support um, around that right to shelter and that concept of a hub, both from Caring Bristol, um, Bristol City Council and shelter. So um, I certainly wish you best success with that. And I know that we're going to continue the conversation um, in, in that regard. Um, so thank you very much, Paul. Um, can I then move on now into the into the business lens um, with um, John and Kirsty um, around talking and sharing about some of the ways that you've been supporting and helping um, in this region, um, but also what ideas you have um, for the future. So if I start with you, John, please. No, thank you. And, and first of all, Paul, that was really enlightening to hear what you were saying. And, and it really sort of brings home to me um, the impact that homelessness has on society and I think um, with that in mind it, it's, it's absolutely essential that business plays a fundamental part in helping to address the problems and if I start by saying um, business as a whole and, and sort of wider commerce we're probably part, part of the problem and in that sense I say because um, as a business we attract people um, to our respective locations uh, collectively business then has the effect of um, you know in, not perhaps directly or indirectly increasing house prices and that and it has issues of, of affordability. But also, um, you know, we are part of the solution. So I said at the outset that I'm a, um, a, spe I'm a solicitor specializing in, in development. So we, we work with clients to help um, secure consents for uh, housing development. And with that includes um, affordable housing. We do a lot of work with affordable housing providers. But that's sort of with my um, professional hat on, as it were, my practice hat, but also in relation to responsible business, um, which is what is our name for corporate social responsibility. And before I sort of go on into more detail, I just wanted to touch on the point that Jessica was making and this point about uh, real value of engagement. And a few years ago, if I think back, I, I uh, went to a community centre in uh, Lawrence Hill and uh, we secured some um, scaffolding um, we secured some uh, paint from uh, one of our clients and we all set about we painted the the wall on the community center it was a good day out uh, it was good team building but uh, you hear hear tales of how some uh, organizations do that and uh, they then phone up a decorator who's qualified to come back the next week to actually um, correct the failings of the the people who've done the work so it really brought home to me that it's one of value and um, it would be much uh, more valuable for us to be engaged um, using our professional skills in whatever form that might be working with um, with charities. And so the, the approach that we have is um, what we call the three E's and it's around about education, entrepreneurship 
and employability, but we also look to um, shape our work around some of the barriers to that. And, and one of the fundamental barriers to all of that is around homelessness. And so it's what work we can do to try and um, address that the, the issues. So pro bono support is something that we're heavily engaged with. And on, from a volunteer perspective, um, every member of, of staff has two volunteer days per year but we encourage people to undertake that, which is going to deliver transformational value. So some of the activities are undertaken by us as a firm. Um, so we might do some initiatives, but equally if people are engaged in um, their own charitable uh, involvement outside of work, they can use their time for that. But it, as I say, it's about um, ensuring that there's transformational support. So um, we also look to, to support uh, organisations where they're much smaller. Previously, we may have had engagement with national organisations and uh, whilst those charities might appreciate the, the donations, they're not as well received in terms of transformational impact as, as uh, charitable giving for smaller organisations. But also we want to make sure from a sustainable perspective that we're not overloading a charity with too much because they may not be able to cope with it. Whilst they, they may be able to deal with it um, during the period of support, uh, we also look make to sorry also look to make sure that when our support for a charity is coming to an end, that we put them into a position whereby they're able to move on to the next um, corporate supporter without being left in limbo. But in terms of the type of support that we're engaged with. Um, in terms of making use of our professional skills. And for that, I don't just mean uh, the lawyers. So half of our staff in Bristol are um, solicitors and the remaining half are in our business services teams. So uh, HR, IT, uh, finance, um, facilities management. And so making use of their skills as well is really um, important. So um, from an employability perspective, we've, we've done a lot of work previously in the past with the Prince's Trust and other organisations where hosting um, CV workshops, uh, interview skills, um, and also to just help to introduce people back into what the, the, uh, the office looks like. Obviously, uh, we've now gone virtual with that kind of assistance, but I know how daunting it can be for anybody who's been out of work for a long time to uh, even just go into an office. And so to help to... Um, uh, help them with that environment as well as giving them the skills and confidence as part of the job application process. Um, we're also involved in um, acting for charities on pro bono basis for example if they're looking to take a lease of, of some premises um, and so uh, helping them to put them into, uh, into those uh, new premises is really important. Um, other work in terms of fundraising, and uh, I do, um, the fundraising element is, is to be honest, it, it is also good fun in terms of uh, bringing teams together and it can be enjoyable, um, even if it is at times challenging. But um, in, uh, in February, I and a number of people in the local real estate community were sleeping out at Ashton Gate um, overnight in sub-zero temperatures raising money for land aid and 1825 independent people. And actually um, that, that was one night um, and you got a, and, you know, the, the faintest of glimpse of what it may be like for somebody who is homeless and actually sleeping on the streets. But what it did do was emphasize for me the, the, um, the, the issue, it helped raise money, um, but also we've been able to continue those conversations with land aid with 1825 as well as to what additional support that can be provided. And other elements that we're engaged with in terms of supporting Feeding Bristol as well, where um, the, uh, the, 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 the situation we find ourselves in the pandemic has, has meant that um, the requirement for food has increased substantially. And as Paul explained, that, that being homeless is not just, um, no matter how serious it is, just about um, being without a home or a permanent place of, of living. It's all of the other issues which arise with it. And so all of these combined, I think, are, are extremely important from our perspective in terms of investing back into our community to make sure that we are supporting the community, but also um, providing job opportunities. And, and we have an apprenticeship scheme, which 
um, is opening up uh, employment both into legal and non-legal roles in uh, for, for people who have traditionally not had the opportunity to get involved. And so that has been a real success for us um, to see the real breadth um, and diversity of thought that you get from um, having an apprenticeship scheme. So that sort of gives you a flavour um, of, of sort of the elements we've been involved with. And then I've, I've keenly noted down all of the asks uh, from David and, and from, from Jessica. So, um, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's something where conversations can continue. Great. Thanks, Paul. And um, I think I think the, the simple concept of the three E's is very simple to grasp. One question I have is, you know, when you have individuals um, in the outreach and, and committed to perhaps they're sharing professional skills and supporting in that way, do you conversely look at their own um, skills acquisition, you know, their own development as an individual by undertaking that volunteering? Because clearly they are also benefiting from that experience themselves. Yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, when, when it comes to um, sort of personal development and uh, appraisals and, and, and sort of regular career catch-ups and career development, it's really interesting to see how people develop because you actually see some people thrive in different ways than you would have otherwise thought when they've been doing probably a similar role, um, but obviously in a different environment. And so uh, we've had some, some of our colleagues um, have been um, providing some project management support to Feeding Bristol um, as they've uh, faced a sort of a, an increase in their demands and, and actually seeing how uh, people are able to deploy their skills in a different environment makes them a, a, a stronger and a more rounded person when they're, they're working um, in, in our own environment. Great, thank you, John. One one other thing that um, uh, just I've been reflecting on really is around how much our business community, in, in for instance, if we take a neighbourhood of Bristol Temple Meads or we took the neighbourhood of the city centre, how much our business communities are actually looking collectively at the capacity they could have to support um, the homeless communities in, in Bristol and also the charities. If we actually understood the capacity that we had to offer, um, whether it's um, skills acquisition or mentoring support, uh, and a range of things. I, I just I just wonder, you know, I don't think we've yet really looked at it in that way and really thought, well, how could we leverage um, the full might of Bristol um, in the city? Um, yeah. Well, if, I mean, if, if I look at it through a sort of a critical lens, I would say that both business and, and the, 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 the charities haven't had a sufficiently coordinated approach as to what their, their asks and the offers are. Um, and so um, what uh, Bristol Law Society is, is doing um, is trying to have a more coordinated approach when it comes to pro bono support or more and more widely through, for example, business in the community uh, are looking to ensure that there is a, um, a more coordinated approach um, such that uh, the requests come in and don't get lost and that the requests get passed on to those people with the most appropriate skills. Um, and if we can have a sort of a, a hub approach to this, it would mean that um, there is a, um, there are a reduced risk that uh, the requests don't just get lost in, in the system. And it means also that um, there might be an opportunity for greater collaboration between business to actually come together and the value that you achieve with that by organisations working closely together, both in relation to the, the particular project, but, but also more widely um, the, the benefits that uh, businesses will achieve through that. Great, thanks, John. It sounds like we've got something concrete to build on there, really, from from the uh, Bristol Law Society, and perhaps grow um, f following this event. Um, Kirsty, <laughs> before I start asking many questions, over to you. Hi there, thank you. Um, so I suppose here at Nationwide. I'm very, very lucky in the fact that the Building Society was set up to help people who couldn't afford homes. So housing and homelessness is a, is a big, big part of our whole strategic um, part of the society. You know, it's got buy in from um, senior leaders down through to sort of colleagues. So it's been really, really helpful that we've got that. Um, so we 
and just picking up on the point that Jessica mentioned earlier on about you know just giving grants is not enough I completely agree completely agree which is why we work really closely with two strategic charity partners <clears throat> Shelter is our one and so is the Mungos who I know on the call today um, so Shelter is a really special partnership we've been it's 20 years we've been working together and we both have the same desires everyone to have a place to call home um, it was used to uh, the hands on my heart it used to be a purely fundraising um partnership but it's really developed into a much more strategic one now to sort of help address the housing emergency we actually fund a policy officer role at um, shelter because we really want to work together with them to make change to government policy and we are actually going to be publishing a report in the next couple of weeks with them on the private rental sector um, and changing conditions in the private rental sector because it's one of the biggest causes of homelessness um, we a lot of our customers are landlords so we um, can actually make a lot of change there and lead the way for other financial services to do so and we have done things such as longer lending and longer term lending um and also with the um the no dss sort of campaign we were the first ones to get to get rid of that so there's there's lots of things that we can do to sort of make fundamental change um with shelter but also our relationship with St Mungo's is a very different one actually it was a business need so we were getting calls very regularly from either from our health and safety team at Nationwide or from our branch network um, because we've got 700 branches all across the UK and we were frequently getting calls from them saying we're going to open up the branch in the morning and there's somebody rough sleeping in the doorway and we just don't know what to do um, and it's actually the um, the approaches were very different if I say if I've been honest and um, there was everything from branches letting um, the rough sleepers into the meeting rooms and letting them have a sleep on the sofa to feeding them um, to the com complete other extreme of calling the police because they didn't know what to do. So we work with some Mungos to develop a learning package for all our branch staff to, to, so they know what to do if they find somebody rough sleeping in one of their doorways or one of their fire exits and it's not to move them on at all. We want to get them the best support is ne um, is necessary and which is why we support um, Homeless Wise from St Mungos. It's basically it's contact details of like people they can contact at a local level to get help for these people but also we're really encouraging other people other retailers to do it on the high street so they're not just passed from door to door and it's really really great to sort of have, have the response from our colleagues about it but also um the impact that we're having on those rough sleepers um and we also said mungos have been going into some of our key city center branches and giving direct sort of one-to-one -one training on how to support them because obviously in big cities such as bristol London and Manchester there is you know a high homeless and um, rough sleeping problem so it's how we can work together with with St Mungo's and local charities on the ground to get them the best support um, but I suppose one thing that we are doing which we haven't really spoken about and it's probably our you know worst kept secret is um, the um, we are actually building houses and um, to sort of pick up on Jessica's point again about actually there's a housing emergency there we haven't got enough houses we are dipping our toes in the housing development field. Um, I'm not going to say we're going to get it right. We don't know. This is the first time we're doing it. But we really wanted to demonstrate where we can add value to a, a development and build a development for the community, not just to make profit. We're not making profit on this. Um, it's in Swindon because our headquarters is in Swindon. Um, it's on an old college site. Um, it's It was a redundant bit of land and we've worked really, really closely with the local community to make sure that the housing that we're building is for the local community. We even employed a community organiser, our dear friend Keith, who is best mates of everybody in there. He, um, he's been talking to everybody and we actually did go and um, hand on my heart, we went to our first consultation with a blank bit of paper and said to the local community, what do you want? Um, and um, for the, I think it's probably unheard of, we didn't get any objections to the planning application, which is fantastic. So we're now building just over 260 houses, mixed, affordable and private. Um, we're working with um, on the green space, on the green spaces, we're working on the cycle networks and we've actually got um, charity foundation set up for the local community so it's a really exciting development um, that we're sort of really really proud to do and we're hoping from that development we can produce a blueprint that we can give to other developers and to the government to say look this is how you should be building houses 
Fantastic, Kirsty. Um, I know we're really looking forward as a panel to, to seeing some of that evidence um, shortly and certainly inform um, a roundtable um, in the future. And I think it would be really highly beneficial as well if we could share into the business community here in Bristol the handbook that you mentioned as well because it is those small scale interventions that can also make such a difference um, and um, put a human face um, on, on tackling homelessness in a, in a professional and appropriate way. Um, so we've, we've now got um, just 12 minutes looking at the time I believe um, until we till we close so we've got the opportunity to take questions um, from those who've been joined us today um, so I don't know whether if you if you have a question do pop it in the Q&A um, we've got a question which is um, from Jez Sweetland around is there a developing Bristol City partnership strategy around housing first so that social housing and companionship support services are offered to those that need it um, so I'm not I'm not personally aware that that exists currently but um, you you may have a different answer david you're nodding <laughs> yes um so housing first is one of those buzzwords that's hit the mainstream um it does mean something quite specific in in that it's a model of service that um has you know housing uh, housing offer an unconditional housing offer at the the center of it uh, and connected uh support for people and there absolutely is a partnership uh, and a housing first service in Bristol. Uh, it's been relatively small scale because it's been funded uh, for the last three years on a one year by one year basis. So it's it's been uh, been slow. There is a funding bid in at the moment, waiting to hear whether that gets expanded. Uh, it's run by the the Golden Key Partnership, which is a um, a, a group of organisations working together to support those people with particularly complex needs. I would say housing first, housing led services, which are also uh, sort of related and some of the traditional styles of services where there are 24 hour staff on site uh, are what you need. It's a whole range, but but there absolutely is that partnership in place in Bristol. But uh, yeah, more would be good, but certainly also that move on accommodation uh, to move people on from, from services that are working as their people are recovering. Great. Great. OK. Oh, I am. I'm off mute. I was just checking there. I thought I was muted still. Um, and just picking up um, really around this levelling up access to borrowing. I mean, that really is key. And um, Nationwide clearly is is making inroads in that direction. I mean, what what more can be done to accelerate other businesses, uh, you know, banks and investors to, to really think differently? What do you think we need to do, Kirsty? Um. That's a really, really good question. I think it's um, we are very much of the um, working together with other financial organisations um, and sort of help getting them to sort of take our lead. I think a really good example of that is um, the work that we've been doing with St Mungo's. We actually invited on a, a to a breakfast briefing we invited Nat West to come along to hear about what we what we'd been doing with St Mungo's and for them to take the same approach um, and um, they, they, I think, I'm, I'm understanding, I think they are, which is great. They're piloting it, which is fantastic. You know, we're not saying this is ours, we're going to keep it. We don't want anybody else to do it. But when we really wanted them to sort of, you know, do what we're doing and say we're not passing the problem down the high street. I think also um, is the changing that we, the changes that we've made um, to our, for our mortgage, um, our mortgage landlords and customers is, you know, we, we heard that, we heard from Shouter a few years ago that, um, people wanted longer tenancies because they just don't the short tendencies that people were getting is that you know they mean having to move on quite quickly they had families they didn't want to move on local you know schools that sort of thing so we actually um changed the rules with our landlords saying they could have longer lending and that actually was a domino effect on other financial organizations so it's actually sort of taking the lead and taking a step up there and and asking other people to take our lead and do and make change well, it sounds like, Kirsty, it might be useful for us to try and hold a forum that literally raises awareness around what can be done and best practice to, to try and gain some momentum on, on shifting that, um, for sure. Um, whilst we've still got a, a, um, looking at questions coming in. The other thing that, that really from the conversation today really strikes me, the, the benefits of 
one, the physical hub of having a centrally located physical hub that can help signpost and, and give a, a place of shelter. But clearly there's an element around the role of digital um, and leveraging this um, partnering of businesses and all of the charities and agencies and social services and unitary authority that are involved. Um, so that we could really leverage the capacity that we have in this region, because I think it's probably rather fragmented in terms of the business side of it is rather fragmented rather than being joined up and really thinking what we could do differently. And even could that play a role in relation to um, accelerating the response of housing first and prioritizing those in need. So I think that's certainly food for thought of, of what could we do collectively in that space. Um, do any of you have um, a particular question or comment that you'd like to pick up on um, with um, another member of the panel that you've heard from today, whilst you have the opportunity all to be here together? If you do, wave at me. <laughs> yes, let's start with you, Jessica, <laughs> and then I'll go to you, Kirsty. Yeah, I just wanted to follow on from what David was saying about how Golden Key has been funded on a one year by one year basis. Um, that's really bad, isn't it? I mean, we all recognise that we need um, housing first and I'm really disappointed in the grant making sector that they give such, such short term grants. Um, and also that so much of the COVID emergency response grants has been for charities that have burnt through their re reserves um, that, and, and offering money that needs to be spent in the next six months. Now that's not gonna help charities recover from a pandemic and be fit for the future um so um, grant funding is always so very short term um and i was really excited to hear um kirsty talking about how they were making longer term lending uh so that um buy to let landlords can offer longer term uh tenancies like that's a sensible move and i think grant funders need to be doing that as well um homelessness is not going to be solved in in one year chunks um, housing first doesn't work if you do it in one year chunks. We have to be looking at long term projects. Great point, Jessica, and I totally agree. So, Kirsty, over to you. Hi, I was just going to um, um, pick up on the point that Paul made about um, the uh, misconception of what homelessness is. And it's a massive thing that we've spent a long time um, educating our, we've got 18,000 employees, um, actually educating them what homeless means. It's it's not just people that are rough sleeping. There is there is hidden homeless out there. And we've spent a long, long time, big educational campaign, getting people to understand that. And it's, it's really, really, um, you know, demonstrated that we uh, the reasons why we support shelter in St Mungo's and it's really increased their fundraising from doing that which is fantastic I think we've still got some way to do it with our members um, and we are planning to do that um, uh, with our sort of 20th anniversary of the shelter partnership coming out next year but I think it's um, yeah that misconception is, re is really really difficult to break through but I think when you do it, it it's it does it does help and it does you know you, you do get some more support for it. Great, Kirsty. So before I start to draw us to a close, is there any other key burning comment that any of the panel would like to make? Um, otherwise, I yes, David. I think Paul first. Yeah, Paul was in there as well, Paul. Okay. Um, yeah, basically all it is, is um, I think I'm trying to buy for my, my campaign now. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd appreciate it if people could actually go on and read the findings of the campaign out of the 100 people that we we actually surveyed and we got responses from um, people being users of the services and the actual service providers. Um, if people wanted to look at them, they'll find them on a right to shelter. And it's, it's quite an interesting read to find out what people are actually saying they want in Bristol and the needs that they, they need in Bristol. 
Thanks, Paul. And I, I, the important thing to say is that following the event today, what we will do is for those um, who've been joining the conversation, we'll share important links so that people have visibility of that information, Paul, because it's a really insightful document and highly relevant. Um, so I'd really like to thank the panel today for their time um, and expertise and ideas around how we can make a difference. Um, and we will summarise those and publish those on the Bristol Housing Festival. Um, fairly shortly after this event. Um, Lizzie, I know that you in particular wanted to thank some of the other organisations that are really providing support during this pe period of pandemic. So would you like to do that now? Well, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, um, I mentioned some of them earlier. Aidbox transferred their normal working practice to giving food parcels to people and their numbers are so impressive about how many people they supported. Bristol Refugee Rights, their kind of workload sort of tripled and the staff were doing an amazing job at working in the emergency response for COVID. Red Cross, Refugee Women of Bristol, or Borderlands were giving free food on a Tuesday. Like the response to people's needs was just so um, amazing and privileged to see it. Um, and also the council supporting BHN to help people with no recourse to public funds, where there's no government funding for that. Um, it's really, truly reflective of this desire to be a city sanctuary. So yeah, just wanted to give them a shout out. Great, thanks, Lizzie. Um, so Jesse, I think we've, almost run out of time at this point in time um, to bring the session to a close. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you for all of you joining the conversation today. If we've not answered your questions, we, we will follow up with you directly. And we are going to carry on with this conversation and hopefully have a round table in about four weeks time so that we can keep moving this forward um, and particularly follow up on some of the ideas today. So thank you very much, everybody.